There are over a million people in America with Parkinson's disease. While the reasons for the disease are largely undiscovered, we who study Parkinson's disease are learning more every year. By taking care of Parkinson patients for over 40 years, I and others have been able to learn much that allows these people to live a better quality of life. This series of programs has been funded by the generosity of the Bell Foundation in honor of Glenn W. Bell, Jr., founder of Taco Bell, and by Elaine and David Darwin. I'm Dee Silver. I'm a neurologist with Coastal Neurological Medical Group, and I'm the medical director of Parkinson's Disease Association of San Diego. I've been at Scripps Memorial Hospital for 40 years, practicing neurology and taking care of movement disorders. During this series of programs about idiopathic Parkinson's disease, I'll explain the pathophysiology, symptoms, treatment, and the hope for the future. We're going to discuss understanding Parkinson's disease, in depth, a view of etiology, biomarkers, and the treatment of Parkinson's disease. I'm going to cover six important areas. First, new thoughts about alpha-synuclein and its role in Parkinson's disease. We're going to discuss imaging and biomarkers in Parkinson's disease. And then we're going to review dopamine agonists and one of the side effects called impulsive compulsive disorder. We're also going to discuss advances in deep brain stimulation. We'll talk about new therapies and I'll briefly review atypical Parkinsonism. Understanding Parkinson's disease, the key is actually making the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis, and it's based upon the triad. The triad of bradykinesia or slowness, rigidity, stiffness, or resting tremor, and all of these have asymmetry. Most importantly, when you see a patient, to have a greater certainty of the diagnosis, you need to follow the case. We also know there are premotor symptoms, meaning non-motor symptoms. And they're possible markers, and they are hyposmia, 80 to 90 percent, REM behavior disorder, 30 to 50 percent of patients will have REM behavior disorder, depression, maybe 50 percent during the disease, 30 percent before, and constipation. In the loss of olfaction, the patients will have 80 to 90 percent of them will have significant loss of smell, but it also anticipates the diagnosis. Now, Hughes in London and the London Brain Bank data did some very important advances in understanding the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. They made the diagnosis in their patients and then they followed them to autopsy. So the, the diagnosis was made initially and the diagnosis was based on bradykinesia or slowness and that was the foundation for the clinical diagnosis plus rigidity and resting tremor and all of these had asymmetry. In the early diagnosis, they evaluated those patients, followed them through their journey, and at autopsy, they found out using those criteria, they were correct in 75% of the cases. Now, Hughes and others followed these patients for 10 years or more, and when the patient had, during those 10 years, a resting tremor, asymmetry, plus some rigidity and akinesia, and a very robust response to L-DOPA, at that time, their diagnosis was correct in 98% of the cases, a very, very significant percentage of correct diagnosis. Now, there's been three phases of Parkinson's disease that has been discussed. And this is out of Stern, Lang, and Pauli on their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, three phases. So phase one is a preclinical phase. This is assumed that there is pathology. So it's assumed that there are Lewy bodies that are uh, accumulated in the patient and the molecular and imaging studies may well pick this up. But there are no clinical signs or symptoms. Now phase two is the premotor area or the premotor phase of Parkinson's disease. And those patients have non-motor signs and symptoms that we've talked about. And they are due to some type of extra niagaral Parkinson's disease pathology, meaning there are Lewy bodies present in that area. Then phase three is the motor part 
of Parkinson's disease. And the pathology, the Lewy body, involves a substantia nigra. And the substantia nigra is the area in the brain that has the dopamine neurons that are either lost or dysfunctional, have some type of deficiency, and the patient starts to develop motor symptoms. And as mentioned, the premotor phase can precede this. Now the preclinical phase is very important. And as I mentioned, it's assumed that there is already Lewy bodies present, or that the brain has Lewy bodies present in them. And we know there are cases of autopsy where the patient has no Parkinson's symptoms, that they have what we call incidental Lewy bodies. Now, how do we look at this phase? Well, genetics is probably a significant part of this preclinical phase. We know now there are 16 genes, and these can be biomarkers, and these genes can also be associated with possible molecular markers that the gene influences. And then, obviously, there are gene-gene interactions, or what we call polygenetic gene influences. There are also certain influences of or on the gene expression or pathway. And these influences can be significant. They may or may not have markers, but they can be aging, toxin, other kinds of insults, such as closed head injury. Biomarkers that indicate pathology before Parkinson's disease is clinically apparent, and we mentioned molecular markers can be present, there can be CSF markers, which we'll discuss, and imaging tests. We talked about DAT scanners, that's an important test. There's new information on MRIs, functional MRIs, and also immunofluorescent tests. The preclinical phase really is prior to any obvious clinical disease. There may be other pathophysiological processes that really should be considered that may be going on as a potentially influencing aspect of the preclinical phase. And some of those could be toxins, inflammatory states, immunological states, infections, or maybe some type of trauma. Now the pathology or the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease is really the hallmark is the Lewy body. And the Lewy body is in the cell body of the neuron. And it's an eosinophilic colored appearance in the cell and in the cytoplasm. And there are also Lewy neurites that are present. They're usually present in the terminals. And these are the hallmarks of the pathological features of Parkinson's disease. Lewy bodies are aggregations of misfolded and toxic alpha-synuclein. It's thought that if it's misfolded, it either is or goes on to develop a toxic type of alpha-synuclein. And this is often termed as fibrils. Aggregated alpha-synuclein may template, it is thought, and may influence alpha-synuclein change from non-toxic to toxic states. It may be in the cell or it may possibly be outside the cell. Or, as Desplants talks about, there may be a toxic protein that may be transmitted to another cell like a prion protein in prion disease. Alpha-synuclein theory is very important, and this is just expanded in knowledge. There's many, many abstracts and studies and papers now being involved in this area. So Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites are present. These are mostly alpha-synuclein, but there are other proteins that are associated with this. As mentioned, they aggregate, they misfold, they go to oligomeres, to fibrils, and then somewhere along the line, they become toxic. And that toxic group of alpha-synucleins are kind of waste, and they are dumped like in a dumpster. And that we can refer to and make an analogy as a Lewy body. The alpha-synuclein is excessive or it's not handled by some type of system, such as a protosome system. It accumulates first probably in the nerve terminals, like in the caudate or in the putamen, and these are probably Lewy neurites. They may be transported down the axon into the cell, and they form intracytoplasmic inclusions. That's that dumpster. That's that bullseye. It's an eosophenolic appearing inclusion in that cytoplasm in the Lewy body. Now, 
Alpha-synuclein aggregates, we think. We think that's a very important aspect of the disease. The mechanism is really not known. But again, there's an analogy now, maybe between the prion protein and how it aggregates. Genetics probably play a major role in this, and we know there are genes that are associated with alpha-synuclein. And it's probably a single gene or some kind of gene-gene interaction. It may be inherited or it may be a mutation. We probably know most of the autosomal and the recessive genes that are important in Parkinson's disease now, but there'll be many more other types of genes that will be discovered. Environment plays a major role. Environment now, we think as pesticides or some type of injury, and we know and keep a common thought that the etiology of Parkinson's disease is genetics plus environment. Overproduction of abnormal alpha-synuclein really seems to be an important role. It's either excessive or it's abnormal. It's unable to be processed or handled in a normal way, such as the ubiquitin protosome system, not cleared, and then it is somehow dumped or stored in the Lewy body. Now, the preclinical phase of Parkinson's disease process is really expanding. And some of the genetic markers now are the alpha-synuclein, DJ1, the LARC2, Parkin, PINK1, and a new gene that's being discovered that is called the DAR DNA BP43. This gene is very interesting because it's seen in frontal temporal dementia and anterior horn cell disease and may play a role in Parkinsonism. Molecular markers are important, and they're associated with some of these genes and their pathways. Terms called protonomics is a new term, and it's going to be used more because it's the understanding of the protein structure and the protein function. And there's going to be biomarkers, molecular markers associated with that. And metabolomics is another area of interest, and it's the concept of detecting and measuring molecules related to the metabolic pathways involved in the disease process. And of course, the genetic influence really has some type of journey that it takes. Now, can proteins in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, which we've referred to as DAT, be transmitted? In Alzheimer's or DAT, there is definitely aggregated A-beta amyloid. And we see this in on animal models, in lab models, and we know that in animal models, this A-beta amyloid can stimulate production of more A-beta aggregation, kind of like that prion phenomenon, or maybe like an infectious agent. And we're taking much of the work that we have done in Alzheimer's into the area of Parkinson's disease. So other studies suggest that A-beta amyloid and alpha-synuclein may be transmitted in some way from one cell to another. Now this is a cartoon from Alano and Prusner, and it makes the analogy between prion and the alpha-synuclein. The prion protein is on the top and the alpha-synuclein is on the bottom. And the concept here is that the prion protein develops prion rods and then develops some type of prion amyloid plaque. Well, with alpha-synuclein, it's postulated that there's alpha-synuclein, it changes into some type of aggregation, forms alpha-synuclein fibrils, and then is somehow captured or dumped into the Lewy body. So in prion disease, the prion protein folds and aggregates, and in alpha-synucleinopathies, which is like Parkinson's disease, or like multi-system atrophy or Lewy body disease, the alpha-synuclein folds and it aggregates. There are many new papers that are dealing with this. So the alpha-synuclein theory, aggregation of a toxic alpha-synuclein, acts maybe as a template, seeds, and spreads its toxicity in some way. Transmission, we talked about, can alpha-synuclein be transported or moved from one cell to another or one area to another? If we have some type of idea how that happens, it will actually support the Brock hypothesis.
because his hypothesis is a matter of sequencing or spread geographically or anatomically of the disease and also the timing. An article by Desplants suggested overexpressed protein is transferred to other cells. And this certainly supp supports the PROC theory of progression. Let's look at one of the biomarkers that occurs in spinal fluid, CSF as we call it. Now we know spinal fluid has been important in analyzing certain diseases and spinal taps are done and we get spinal fluid. In Alzheimer's disease, there's been studies that show the spinal fluid has low beta amyloid level. Now the beta amyloid is a protein in Alzheimer's that is stored and is in the senile plaque. And elevated phosphorylated tau is present in patients with Alzheimer's disease and that tau is elevated. So in Alzheimer's disease, there's low beta amyloid and there's elevated phosphorylated tau. Now they're looking at Parkinson's disease and there's several studies going on now, but they're analyzing the spinal fluid and they're actually doing that at UCSD. And it su is suggested now that there's a low alpha-synuclein level and a low phosphorylated tau. CSF data may be used now and it's been written about to be able to have the spinal fluid analysis of these proteins to discriminate between certain neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body disease, and atypical Parkinson's disease. This would be very helpful, especially in some patients who have dementia, and when they progress with it, the spinal fluid markers and their levels would be of benefit and helpful clinically. So now let's switch to another topic, which really involves another clinical marker and it's REM behavior disorder. There are clinical markers they may anticipate Parkinson's disease. One is REM behavior disorder. Another one is loss of olfaction, which may precede Parkinson's disease. And as I mentioned, that 80 to 90% of patients with Parkinson's have lost their sense of smell. Constipation is another one. There's a study in Hawaii in the Asian population. If you had one bowel movement every three days, you had a four times greater risk of developing Parkinson's. However, 80% of those patients who had one bowel movement in three days didn't develop Parkinson's disease. So premotor is very important. And these aspects are seen in Parkinson's, Lewy body disease, multisystem atrophy, and REM behavior disorder is seen in those three diseases. They're all alpha-synucleinopathies. There are risk factors for developing REM behavior disorder. Now, REM behavior disorder, before I go over the risk factors, is an entity where the patient is asleep, they're having rapid eye movement, that's where you get the term REM, they're dreaming, and unlike the normal person who is a tonic or can't move, the Parkinson patient or the patient with Lewy body disease or multi-system atrophy can act out their dreams. They have the ability to express motor activity. So they scream, they howl, they howl, they shout, they move around, and they can do other things. All dangerous things possibly can occur, such as falling out of bed, getting a fracture, or a subdural. Now the risk factors for developing REM behavior disorder, the older the age, the greater the chance of developing it. Males have it more than females. People who smoke have it more common than those who non-smoke. And also closed head injury cases. If you had a history of closed head injury, you may have a greater predisposition to developing REM behavior disorder. There's a suggestion that if you've had pesticide exposure, if you're in the farming, or if you had a lower education, or an earlier onset of Parkinson's disease, now remember, 35 to 50% of patients with Parkinson's do have REM behavior disorder. And you need to get that in the history because it can be a dangerous, significant marker. Oftentimes there are subtypes of Parkinson's disease that are more likely to have REM behavior disorder. And there are people who have hallucinations, cognitive impairment, and this rigid, stiff type of Parkinsonism called akinetic rigid 
type. So REM behavior disorder, 50 to 60% of the patients with REM behavior disorder, when they're collected only with the diagnosis, will go on to have Parkinson's disease at some time in 10 to 15 years. But they can also have Lewy body disease or multi-system atrophy. REM behavior disorder occurs with REM sleep and where usual atonia is lost. Vocal and motor outbursts. These patients may also have periodic leg movement disorder, which is involuntary movements at night. And they can have higher risks of injury as we discussed. Hip fracture is a high risk phenomenon because if you fracture your hip, a third of the patients could be dead in a year and many never get out of bed or a wheelchair. Subdurals and other injuries are not uncommon. Now, since we're talking about REM behavior disorder, let's talk a little bit about movements in sleep in Parkinson's disease. Now, we're talking about movements that occur. Well, restless leg syndrome occurs in 15% of patients with Parkinson's. Only 10% of the control group or the actual population that's normal in the United States has restless leg syndrome. Now, what is restless leg syndrome? Well, it's a sensation that occurs before when you have a sensation in the legs or the arms. And restless leg syndrome can occur in the arms. Then there is an urge to move the legs. So you have the sensation, and then you have an urge to move the legs. And then with, re with movement, you get relief. This restless leg syndrome usually occurs in the evening or at rest. And the medication that's used, such as dopamine agonist, neurontin, or gabapentin, or some other drugs, often develop a tolerance or augmentation. And a tolerance is you increase the drug and the patient needs more and more drug so they can have continued improvement. Or augmentation is where they have the event, it occurs in the late evening, but you treat the patient with your drug like a dopamine agonist, and then after several months, the symptoms start to occur in the afternoon. That's called augmentation. Then there's periodic leg movement disorder, which we referred to that can be associated with REM behavior disorder or restless leg syndrome or obstructive sleep apnea. And it's a periodic movement that occur occurs in a very significant periodic interval, usually 45 seconds or maybe more. So every 45 seconds, the patient can get a movement, and that movement is usually a flexion of the toes, feet, or the legs. And that duration is just in seconds. And the problem is the patient is aroused, and this oftentimes is associated with excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, there are other sleep disorders in Parkinson's. They're not as common as predictors or premotor symptoms, but they're insomnia, sleep fragmentation, and early morning wakening. We talked about REM behavior disorder. 35 to 50% of Parkinson patients have it. We talked about obstructive sleep apnea. It occurs in 60 to 80% of patients who have Parkinson's, usually in the patients that are heavier and are smokers or have COPD. And excessive daytime sleepiness or hypersomnia definitely occurs. It occurs in 25 to 30% of patients with Parkinson's, 5 to 12% in controls. Now, who are really likely to get these sleep disorders? Well, if a patient's depressed, if they're on dopamine agonists, L-DOPA, if they have a higher dose or the duration of the dose is longer, older people have it, if they have mild cognitive impairment, such as mild cognitive impairment or MCI. Mild cognitive impairment or MCI is when the patient has the inability to store recent information, what we call encoding. But they don't have all the features of dementia, such as significant loss of memory with trouble with speech, recognizing objects, and motor abnormalities such as apraxia. And females are more likely to have sleep disorders. So now let's switch gears and let's talk about one of the possible markers that can be used in the pre-motor phase and also maybe in the preclinical phase. And that's the DAT scanner or the SPECT scan. This is a radioactive isotope, a SPECT scan, and it uses ifluropane, which contains iodine. 
There is an uptake of this isotope in the substantia nigra neurons presynaptic dopamine terminal, and that is present in the putamen and the caudate. And I'll show you that on the imaging. The isotope is measured as an image, but it does not have at the present time really quantitative measuring. There's an uptake reduction in these Parkinson patients, and it's usually sensitive to about 85 to 90 percent for Parkinson's disease. But unfortunately, there's also a reduction of uptake in this imaging in patients that have PSP, multi-system atrophy, in other types of diseases, and Lewy body dementia. The DAT scanner is normal in essential tremor, and that's where we use this as a differentiating tool most likely, because essential tremor sometimes is in the differential diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So the DAT scanner is normal in essential tremor, but it's also normal most likely in vascular Parkinson's disease. There's some question about that, but it certainly has a different appearance. But it's definitely normal in drug-induced Parkinson's disease and psychogenic or neuropsychiatric Parkinson's disease. The DAT scanner's image looks like what we see on this slide. And their images are seen, and on the left panel, you can see the healthy subject. There's nice images, they're significant, they have different colors, but there's a very prominent yellow, red, and blue. And this is normal, and it's symmetrical. But on the right-hand side, you can see there is a reduction of the image, and this is reduction in some of the colors, but it's also significantly asymmetrical. Now, we know in some patients prior to their developing Parkinson's disease, especially in the twin studies, that this can be used as a preclinical marker. So dopamine agonists. I want to discuss dopamine agonists in this session because really we are on some cutting edge concepts of dopamine agonists, but mainly because of the adverse side effects, and that involves impulsive compulsive disorders. Now, the dopamine agonists act on the postsynaptic dopamine receptor. It bypasses the loss of the substantia nigra dopamine and the dopamine cell, where really there is a loss of neuronal capacity to manufacture dopamine. And dopamine, of course, is a neurotransmitter that allows the message to go from one neuron to another. For example, the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. Now, dopamine agonists, we know from clinical trials, delays the need for L-DOPA. It delays the development of motor complications, which are two, dyskinesias and fluctuations. We know that dopamine agonists work in monotherapy and advanced Parkinson's disease, patients that have fluctuations. And, of course, we know that it improves off time. There are four agents available, as I mentioned, ropinerol is Requip, Pramipexol is Mirapex, and rotigotine is the patch, and apomorphine is the rescue drug or the sub-Q. That drug is very helpful in some patients. Now we know that dopamine agonists have longer half-lives. Ropinerol is four to six hours, Mirapex or Pramipexol is 10 to 14. And now they come in extended release forms, which allows the plasma level to be more consistent and higher throughout the whole day. They improve activities of daily living, quality of life, reduce off time. And when looking at some meta-analysis, looking at numbers of trials, it looks like they improve off time about 1 to 1.8 hours. They delay time to dyskinesia. They allow reduction of the L-DOPA dose by about 20%. But it was hoped that they delayed the progression of Parkinson's disease. But there's been a number of studies, which I participated in, that showed there is not any evidence that they delay the progression of Parkinson's disease. Now, to one of the expanding areas of the knowledge of dopamine agonists is the side effects. Nausea, somnolence, hallucinations are known. Hallucinations are not uncommon. Delusions hand and ankle edema, cognitive changes, 
and orthostatic hypotension either brought out symptomatically or made worse. But the one that is very significant and that's getting more press and that can be very detrimental is the impulsive compulsive disorders. And the one that is a concern especially is gambling because of the loss of money that can occur. So what is an impulsive compulsive disorder? It is a maladaptive, destructive behavior in Parkinson's disease that occurs frequently with the use of dopaminergic medications. More so with dopamine agonists, and both of those, ropinerol and premopexol, are equally able and capable to cause impulsive compulsive disorders, but less so L-dopa. So the Dominion study was done, and Dr. Weintraub was one of the important investigators in that, and it showed that 17% of patients on dopamine agonist medication developed impulsive compulsive disorders. 13% on all medications developed impulsive compulsive disorders, but only 6.9% developed impulsive compulsive disorders when they were not on dopamine agonists. And what are these? They're gambling. This is the one where people lose lots of money. Spending, eating, buying, pornography, hypersexuality, excessive computer use. And then there's an interesting entity called punding. And punding can occur with L-dopa, probably more with dopamine agonists, but punding is a purposeless repetitive, meaningless motor behavior, like taking something apart and putting it together, taking it apart and putting it together. Impulsive compulsive disorder risk factors are important to know. And interestingly, the study and knowledge that we're gaining in these impulsive compulsive disorders and risk factors are going to be very helpful to the understanding of addiction because the dopamine transmitter is the reward transmitter. So what are the risk factors? They're younger people, they have a longer history of Parkinson's disease. And we're talking about impulsive compulsive disorders in Parkinson patients. They're usually on higher doses of medication, as mentioned, dopamine agonists especially, but also L-dopa. And in my experience, some people who've never been on the drugs can have impulsive compulsive disorders. And I remember some farmers in Iowa that definitely before L-dopa, had impulsive compulsive disorders. Most of these patients will have more severe motor impairment. And interestingly, they may have history of past addictions, especially history of addiction to gambling. And that's an important history to know about before you start them on drugs. But in our study, and we've been screening for impulsive compulsive disorders in our practice now for about 12 years, and we always screen the patient. It's a self-assessment, but I always ask the caregiver or the family. And we and other people have shown that there's an increased incidence of family history of addictions, hence bringing about this concept of genetic influence. So as I mentioned, dopamine agonists are most likely to cause ICD aspects. L-dopa can do it. Amanidine has been documented to cause impulsive compulsive disorders and controls are of interest because people who have access to gambling casinos may have a little higher incidence of gambling. So what's the treatment for this problem, impulsive compulsive disorders? Well, you taper off the drugs in a logical order. And obviously it's the dopamine agonist that needs to be tapered off first. They may need to reduce it to very low dose or off entirely. And you have to taper it so you don't develop the dopamine withdrawal syndrome that we did talk about. The dopamine dysregulation syndrome, called DDS, is an impulsive compulsive disorder. And who are these patients? Well, it was probably first described by Lees in England. But there are patients who develop addictions or overuse of dopamine agonists and or L-dopa. The overuse is done despite motor complications or side effects. These patients become drug seeking or hoarding. And oftentimes they'll come in with severe dyskinesias and tell you that they have no off time but they need more medication. Oftentimes these patients will become 
difficult. They become argumentative, aggressive, agitated, euphoric, and if you try to reduce the dose, they will leave your practice. So the important aspect is you have to have gradual withdrawal of the dopamine agonist. But again, you have to be careful of this dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome. The patient will get fatigue, anxiety, agitation, sweating, irritability, and sleep disturbance. It's important to know that the dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome does get better with time. But it seems to be, in my experience, and we've seen numbers of these, that the more cognitively impaired and the longer the patient has had the drug use, the more difficult it is to get the patient off and the longer these symptoms will last. But in my experience and the literature's experience, they all go away. Let's switch now to an important topic called deep brain stimulation. Now this is important because there's a lot of new advances that have taken place involving the program and the technology and the stimulator. So what is deep brain stimulation? Well, there are electrodes, there are wires, and there are stimulators that are placed in the patient. These electrodes are located in the subthalamic nucleus or in the globus pallidus interna. And these electrodes, it's thought that it works by a desynchronization of excessive hyperexcitability from cortex or other nuclei that feed into the subthalamic nucleus. We have a stimulator that's placed in the chest. It, we call it the IPG. And there are four electrodes on each side of the brain and we can give four programs for each side. And this four program concept is really new. And we program these electrodes and have various types of formats. One is called the monopolar, one's bipolar, tripolar, interleaving, and most patients can adjust these programs. Go from one to the other, all four of them, and sometimes adjust the voltage. This is one of my patients that's had DBS, and he's going to turn off his IPG. And he can do that, and you'll notice that he didn't have much tremor before, but now in his right hand, he's getting dramatic increase of the tremor because the IPG is off. The DBS is no longer desynchronizing the subthalamic nucleus. And this is an important documentation and demonstration of this tremor that occurs. Now he's going to go ahead and turn his IPG on again. And you'll see he gets a dramatic improvement in the tremor. Now it takes just a few seconds, but that is an important response. And this is an enormous advance and we have electrode selection, voltage, rate, and pulse width. This is a picture of a person with the deep brain stimulator equipment. We have the stimulator, the extension wire, which goes from the stimulator under the skin, under the scalp, into the area in the front part of the brain. The neurosurgeon puts a burr hole there. He puts electrodes uh, via lead wires into the nucleus of choice. He cements that lead wire into the skull of the patient so it's not mobile. This next picture shows the placement, and this shows in various colors the thalamus, the globus pallidus, and the subthalamic nucleus. And at our center, we mainly do subthalamic nucleus stimulation, but for essential tremor, it can be placed in the thalamus, and sometimes we do it in the globus pallidus. But you can see these nuclei are quite deep, and so the electrode and the probe has to go all the way from the top of the brain to this deep area. Now, deep brain stimulation history in San Diego. In 1992, I spent a significant amount of time with Bill Kohler at Kansas City and Warren Alano in New York and several other physicians, along with Ken Ott. I felt we had the technique and the capability of doing deep brain stimulation, so I brought it into San Diego in 1994, and we did our first case. Now we have 250 cases that Dr. Ott has done, 
and over 100 of those are mine. Our results are really good. And most importantly, you need to have an experienced surgeon and an experienced programmer to do these types of procedures. The surgeon has to have good concept of localization. We do them at Scripps Memorial Hospital and we, they're done at UCSD and in other centers. Prior optimized pharmacological therapy is key in this consideration. And some patients come to me that have never been on Aldopa and so obviously they are not candidates because they have to have a trial of L-DOPA because the best they'll ever do is how they've done the best on L-DOPA. So patient selection is the key to the best results. It reduces the chance of poor outcomes. The patient has to have robust benefit to L-DOPA. The patient should have some dyskinesias. Endose failure is important and some tremor. The patient should be below the age of 80 but some patients that we do are between 75 and 80, but they are in good health. The patient has to have normal cognition and they have to have a normal neuropsychiatric history. I don't use a lot of neuropsychiatric testings. I have my own questionnaire on cognition and psychiatric aspects, and also we do the mini mental state exam or the MOCA. And that gives us enough experience rather than doing very expensive testing. The patient should have minimal comorbidity, such as should have little or no heart disease or pulmonary problems. They should have good home support and they should be able to handle technology, especially now since we have four programs that are possible. DBS has been shown to be better than best medical therapy. It also, as I mentioned, reduces dyskinesia, endose failure, tremor, and it reduces the dose of L-DOPA by about 50%. How much endos failure is actually reduced in hours is really very variable. Now, what are the risk factors that occur with deep brain stimulation? And the patient has to understand these very clearly. The biggest one, I think, is intracerebral bleed, and the rate is about 1%. Dr. Bill Ando in Texas did a group of analysis on patients, over 300. We participated in that, and the average intracerebral bleed was about 1%. Stroke can occur, seizures, infections, especially infections in the hardware, hardware failures such as fractures, and neuropsychiatric changes. It's important to point out neuropsychiatric complications, depression, mania, suicide. There have been people that have committed suicide, cognitive changes, and worsening of the cognition, and there have been cases that have developed impulsive compulsive disorders. But also, there's been cases, deep brain stimulation, that have improved their impulsive compulsive disorders. Now, while we're talking about cognition, let's briefly review the degree and severity of cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. We know that in early Parkinson's disease, 31% of the patients will have mild cognitive impairment, difficulty with recent memory, but 8% can have dementia. Advanced Parkinson patients who are diagnosed and then follow for 3.5 years, 57% of them can have mild cognitive impairment, and 10% at 3.5 years can have dementia, and that's a significant percentage. Medications can be associated with cognitive impairment, and how is it you discontinue them to improve cognition in some of your patients? Well, first of all, you taper, and you taper the medicines that are more likely to cause cognitive impairment, and that's anticholinergics, amanadine next, dopamine agonists should probably be next in the drug that's being discontinued or tapered, MAO type B inhibitors, and last, L-DOPA, because it's such a robust therapeutic management. Medications that can treat the cognitive impairment are the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, like Exelon. And for neuropsychiatric aspects, quintiapine or clozapine can be used. These patients should not have any deep brain stimulation. Now I'd like to switch a little bit now into new advances in therapy, mainly drugs. And I'm going to briefly mention this, and obviously we can't go over them all and all the data. But the first one is the adenosine 2A antagonist. Now these drugs 
of different types have been around for quite some time. We did some of the largest clinical trials of the first adenosine 2 A antagonist, and that drug was not released by the FDA. But we thought it was a benefit, and it improved off time and dyskinesias. But now there are several other new adenosine 2 antagonists, and it looks like they're a benefit, and some may be released. But they improve dyskinesias and off time. Glutamate antagonists are in trials, and they also improve some of the dyskinesias and off time. There's a new drug, a serotonin antagonist, that's being used for neuropsychiatric signs and symptoms. We're studying that drug. It looks pretty good, but they're all double-blind controlled trials. It's important to point out coenzyme Q10 has no benefit. There have been numbers of studies now, and the latest one says it's not of benefit. It's an expensive drug, but it doesn't help Parkinson's disease. Ritari is the new drug that's going to be coming out. And this is a drug formulated to release in the small intestine. And as the drug goes through the small intestine, it releases L-DOPA gradually, and it has a longer plasma half-life, and I'll discuss that later. There are now some surgical procedures. Adeno-associated viral vector, encoded with glutamic acid decarboxylase, which is an enzyme, and they're tagged to the viral vector. They're placed in certain areas in the brain, and the exact results of those studies are not out yet. There's some evidence that they may be a benefit, but they're very early in their stages. Also, other viral vectors using trophic factors are going to be used and they look very promising. There are now three new drugs that are in the study format. One is an oral drug for dyskinesias, and as you can see, it's 70 minutes more of on time without dyskinesias, 50 minutes less of off time. The next drug is a partial dopamine agonist and a serotonin agonist, and that's been shown to be a benefit reduces off time by about 45 minutes. That's not very robust, not as good as risagiline is, or Azelect, or as Capone, and it's not as good as the Retari that I will discuss. A prodrug that goes to L-DOPA has been studied. It reduces off time somewhat and more on time. The exact data on that is uncertain. But I want to talk now about Ritari. Ritari was an impacts drug. It had its number IPX066. And in my office in La Jolla, we did two of these clinical trials. It was a great experience because this drug is a benefit. And I'm going to go over the details with this drug. It's an extended release oral L-DOPA formulation. And as we say, it's in sprinkles or in little beads. This drug is taken by mouth and its absorption is in the small intestine. And its absorption is delayed by these sprinkles that release the L-DOPA slowly as it goes through the small intestine. Now, it's interesting to note the transit time from the stomach to the cecum is about four hours. Now, how long this drug is released in the small intestine, I don't know. But we do know that once this drug is given, the plasma level of this drug stays high for about five to six hours. So the idea is that because the way this drug is formulated, beads dissolve in relationship to the pH of the intestine and to the polymer characteristics and how it's structured. Now the evidence for Ritari is based upon three trials. This drug gave longer sustained plasma levels, as I mentioned, five to six hours. Now, if you remember, L-DOPA, in its current immediate release, has a 90-minute half-life. So it has a fairly immediate absorption, as does this drug, but the plasma level rapidly declines. But there has been pharmacokinetic studies that show in this drug, the plasma level stays high for five to six hours. But it rapidly goes to its maximum plasma level as quickly as immediate release L-DOPA. This drug needs less frequent dosing, three to four times a day, 
It reduces off time by about 1.17 hours. It's much better than placebo, and it actually reduces off time more than enticapone. It was not compared to Azelect or Resagiline. There's more on time with less troublesome dyskinesia, which is important. And the Parkinson Quality Life Scales and the UPDRS Motor Scales, Part 2 and 3, are much better. Now, the dosing is always going to be a question because we're going to take this drug and we're going to immediately change the dosing overnight. So the patient will take their last L-DOPA at night and want to start Retari the next day. And what we'll do is the dosing is 2 to 1 Retari to immediately lease L-DOPA. It comes in three doses, 95, 145, and 195. So say, for example, that the patient is on 400 milligrams of immediate release L-DOPA. The next day when Retari is started, and I think it'll be able to be just switched overnight, the next day we will start that patient on 800 milligrams, or about that, of the Retari. They will only take the dose three to four times a day, with or without meals, but I'll probably recommend without meals initially. And it's, it's an interesting bit of information that came out about this drug, that if the patient takes a fatty meal at night with the drug, it has a potential of prolonging the drug plasma level up to seven to eight hours. Now, how many patients will do this in and how consistent this is, we're not certain. But think of how important this is. Say a patient has a significant off time at night. They can't get out of bed. They have off dystonia. They have severe off tremor. You'll be able to take this drug at night, take a fatty meal, and the plasma level will be a benefit for seven to eight hours. This drug has an 80% bioavailability and the adverse side effects will be like L-DOPA. Now there's another form of using L-DOPA. I was asked to do this study by Mark Stacy. Four years ago, we didn't do it because it involves a tube that's outside the body that has to be placed into the gut and the patient gives the medication, which is a gel, by syringe. And there's a very significant intensive procedure here. It's intensive for the patient, it's intensive for the caregiver, and it's doctor intensive. Can you imagine getting called up in the middle of the night that your tube came out? So it can be a problem. But if you have a system set up, it may work. This reduced off time by about 1.9 hours. But the exact data as compared to placebo is not yet known. But remember the triangle that we use to evaluate all drugs. Efficacy, tolerability, and safety. This drug may be efficacious. It probably has some tolerability, like L-DOPA. The question is the tolerability of the procedure. Well, we look at the aspects of the adverse side effects, device complications in 51% of the patients, abdominal pain 42%, wound complications can occur in 16%, nausea 25%, infection 17%, and the important aspect is that this side effect profile reflects much like the feeding tubes that can occur, plus the drug. So we'll see how that goes. You're going to have to have a significant supporting system set up for the use of this. Now, I would place this L-DOPA intestinal gel, which we call LDIG, as a use in the medication format or the algorithm as before DBS in patients that are looking for DBS to see if it works or in cognitively impaired patients. I think the Retari will be a much better selection for an L-DOPA drug. So as we're talking about markers, pre-clinical, pre-motor, and motor, the question always comes up from patients, do I have Parkinson's disease? And do I have an atypical Parkinson's disease? So let's briefly review three or four of the most important. Well, progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, is the most common atypical Parkinson syndrome that I see. It's probably 8 to 10% of my patients. It's the most common, and there are subtypes, but I'm not going to go over those tonight. You can look those up if you want uh, by 
Googling some of the subtypes of PSP. What does this PSP look like? Well, first of all, they have postural instability and falls, and they occur early, usually in the first two, three years. There is vertical loss of movement of the eyes, or what we call gaze palsy, first and then lateral. So the patient can't look with their eyes when you ask them to follow. So for example, they wouldn't be able to look like this, or look like this, or the one that's affected most is the vertical. They wouldn't be able to look down. Importantly, I find that the very earliest sign of this gaze palsy, which we call supranuclear palsy, is when I walk in the room, the patient has to turn their whole head to see me. The patients have dysarthria, dysphagia, and pseudobulbar affect. They have blepharospasm, rigidity, akinesia, and they have this very interesting extension posturing that occurs. Cognitive changes are not uncommon. They have a frontal type of dementia. It occurs later in 50% of the cases. They also have an interesting phenomenon called retrocollis, where their head is extended way back, and it can be painful, and sometimes Botox will help that. The patients with PSP have a shorter lifespan than Parkinson's. Remember, Parkinson's can live 20 to 25 years, but this group, by and large, will live only about seven to eight years. Now, the pathology is different. It's not a synucleinopathy. It doesn't have alpha-synuclein in the pathology or as a major part of the pathology. It's what we call the tauopathy. And there are several genes. One of them is called the MAPT gene, and these are accessible. Pathology, they have a globose neurofibrillary tangle. So PSP is the most common. Next is multi-system atrophy, and MSA as we call it. It's not as common as PSP. It has many divisions, but one of them is called MSAC, the other one MSAP. C stands for cellular beller. P stands for Parkinsonism. So let's look at this. And again, this is an atypical Parkinson's. And why do you want to know this? Because people will say, my disease is progressing more rapidly. I don't think I've got Parkinson's or there are other changes. So we think of PSP or MSA. Now, MSAC is cerebellar. They have early gait disturbance, balance, falls, arm and hand in coordination, dysarthria, and this syndrome called Strider. Strider, which can be very dangerous, sounds like this. <laughs> and the patient will have that. But in multi-system atrophy cerebellar, like PSP, the most important thing is gait, balance is a problem, and they end up with severe impairment of walking in the first two or three years. Now, MSA Parkinson's has akinesia, rigidity, postural instability, early falls. Significant number of them have a postural tremor, and the postural tremor is when your hands are out like this, and your hands are extended, and they start to shake. Or the kinetic tremor is when you pick up a spoon and you develop the tremor as you go to your mouth. 30% of them can have the resting tremor. It's not as classical as a classical pill rolling tremor that's seen in Parkinson's, but it can be very similar. Dystonia occurs, occurs and the MSA has an antiflexion. And the antiflexion is when the chin is forced on the chest. Sometimes Botox helps that. Now, both MSA and PSE have a brief or poor response to L-DOPA. Cortical basal degeneration is another atypical Parkinson's disease. It's got a little different kind of clinical picture. It can be confused with other entities. But the reason I have patients understand this somewhat is because it has an evolving pattern and a journey that has some changes that the patients can pick up. It begins usually as a cognitive or behavioral change, later gait, hence emphasizing this can have some frontal or cortical pathology. The patients have akinesia or slowness, rigidity, focal dystonia is not uncommon, myoclonus, which is a rapid jerk that occurs like this, or apraxia, which means they have difficulty handling objects with their hands, and all of this that I have mentioned is very asymmetrical. They also can have dysarthria. They have an interesting phenomenon called the alien limb syndrome, and it's picked up by families 
and doctors very early because the hand is kind of there but the patient doesn't know it is. And you ask them to do something and they really can't control it. We call that the alien limb syndrome. These patients have their onset at about 50 to 70 years and they often times are confused with PSP, frontal temporal dementia, and dementia of the Alzheimer's type. The latter because of the cortical features. And this is a tauopathy. So unlike multisystem atrophy and Parkinson's disease, who, which are alpha-synucleinopathies, this is a tauopathy. I want to briefly mention vascular Parkinsonism. I mentioned to you in the DAT scanner, probably vascular Parkinsonism is probably normal, maybe slightly abnormal, but this is clinically a very rigid akinetic syndrome. We call it an akinetic rigid syndrome. The lower body's involved more. It's stiff, their difficulty using the legs when they walk, their legs are stiff and the trunk is stiff and it's involved more than the arms. They rarely have tremor, some have dysarthria, and I like to break it down into kind of three groups of vascular Parkinsonism. And if there's doctors watching this, they'll understand that. There can be subacute, where you get small stepwise progression of symptoms, where you have one stroke and then you have another little event and you get worse. Then there's the actual acute deep stroke that looks like Parkinsonism. And that occurs, but not very commonly. A new understanding of white matter disease on MRI, giving a slow, chronic presentation of Parkinsonism is a very exciting field because many people as they get older will de develop a significant amount of white matter on their MRI. So what's the risk factors to Parkinson's that is vascular in origin? Diabetes, obesity, hypertension, vascular disease, prior strokes, hyperlipidemia, amyloid angiopathy, which is a type of angiopathy that has amyloid deposited, and some interesting entities like antiphospholipid syndromes, which have to do with various phospholipids and proteins. So our overview of this program has been new thoughts about alpha-synuclein, and I tried to give you cutting-edge information. Since we don't do these programs that regularly, it's important to have the newest information and how alpha-synuclein plays a role in Parkinson's. Where are we with imaging and biomarkers in Parkinson's disease? It's ever expanding. We've reviewed dopamine agonists and the new considerations of impulsive compulsive disorders. We've talked about advances in deep brain stimulation, the ability to have four programs for each side of the brain with the patient being able to change programs is very, very helpful. And new therapies we talked about, and we reviewed atypical Parkinsonism. I appreciate you spending this time learning about and understanding Parkinson's disease.